right. Well, as we are in our third week of this series called I Will Love dot dot dot, we are also, as has been shared already, on Mission Sunday today. Today is the big day where we have been asking all this month and even from the month before as we've been preparing, kind of setting the stage for this day, this opportunity to give to support some incredible works across the globe that we've been partnering with for the last number of years. We've arrived here today at Mission Sunday, asking you to give generously beyond your typical weekly offering. In fact, we've asked that if you could, if it's within your capability, that you'd consider giving up to five times as much as you would give on a typical Sunday. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute, but even as I make that ask, that request, that we would consider giving generously, maybe initially on the front end, that's kind of a hard sell, but as we've been sharing videos this whole week of some of the work that's, or this whole month of work that's been happening in Mexico, India, and other places, I hope that it's seeing some of these images and these videos that moves you to see that we're not just giving because we're asked to give. Yes, that's true. We're giving because what we're giving to is completely worth giving to. And so I want to show you one more video that will kind of set the stage for why we give today. So Ciudad de Angeles, or City of Angels, is in Cozumel, Mexico. It's one of the works that we support and have been for a number of years as one of the contributing churches to the mission work that takes place there as this City of Angels serves as a children's home uh, in Cozumel, Mexico. And so it's one of those places that we get to go and visit with as well. And so as you give, you can see that there are many families in this church that support individual children as part of their giving, and we'll be giving to that as well today. Well, we are um, in this series, again, called I Will Love, and we've been moving through kind of a number of progressions. As we talked about first, this call to love the gospel, the story of a God who would love us so deeply 
that he would give his son for us to redeem us. A God who loves this world so deeply that he wants to see this broken world restored and wants to see us join him on that mission. And that's the mission that he's called us into, to be part of the restoring work of God, to be part of the reconciling work of God. As we engage with people who don't know Jesus yet, who don't know that this, yes, this world is broken, and they see that, but don't know that there's a God who wants to restore the world and make things as they should be. And today, we'll be talking about the call to love our neighbor. Guys, I'm clicking and it's not advancing, so you may have to help me back there. I will love my neighbor. Next week, we'll be looking at the call to love this world. And so these two messages in this series really go together, thinking kind of first about our circles and then about this big circle that we call the world. How can we love and love well so that people will come to know Jesus, so that people can know a God who loves them? Will we love? You know, several uh, years ago, probably about five, six years ago, I was sitting in a meeting of local area ministers. We call it the Lead Pastors Roundtable. And so we come together roughly once a month just to kind of engage with each other. It's good to kind of be supported by others who are doing similar things and also to kind of get ideas from each other, to share, hey, what's happening at your place, at your church where you serve? What's happening where you serve? And so we share those ideas, and sometimes we come away with really good things from that. Well, this was a really good thing that I came away with from one of the meetings that we had probably, again, probably roughly six years ago. As one of the guys there was sharing about this book that he had read called The Art of Neighboring. You may have participated with us, uh, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic, as we weren't able to be here, we were trying to say, how can we get into our neighborhoods and still make a difference with the message of Jesus, even though we can't gather here? How can we be the church out there if we can't be the gathered church in here? And so we walked through this series, some of you will remember, um, together on a shared Zoom class that we did. On this book, The Art of Neighboring, there's this little diagram and puts you at the center, and then there are eight squares that have little homes inside of them with no names there. And so you write your name here, and then the call is to then turn around and write the names of eight neighbors that you know that you're aware of. And what was really rough, as this was introduced to us as, you know, as those who are ministering to churches and within our communities, I remember the challenge was given by the guy who was leading that for all of us to, again, fill in our name here and then write the names of eight neighbors that we, we know. And can I tell you, not a one of us in that room were able to write down the names of eight neighbors that we knew. And so the question came, how well are we neighboring? And we lived in our neighborhood at that point in time for about six, you know, six months, maybe a year, but but I realized that six months or a year should have been enough for me to know who was living across the street from me and right next to me and maybe down the road from me. I, I should have known this better, especially if I wanted to make a difference in my community, my neighborhood. If I wanted to be able to love like Jesus in a way that my neighbors would take notice, I needed to know who the people were who lived next to me. I needed to know their names. I needed to know what they were into, what they were struggling with. I needed to know if they had a relationship with Jesus or not, if they were church connected, if they were all these things. I, I needed to know. I need, I need to know your kids' names. I need to be engaged with you more fully. If I want to show you that there's a God who loves, if I want to show you that as a child of God, I will love. You know, this idea of loving our neighbors is all throughout Scripture. It's something that Jesus speaks to directly. In fact, I want you to see, we're going to look at a number of passages this morning just to kind of bring together an idea of what it looks like to love our neighbors and why you and I are called to love our neighbors. And we're going to begin with the one that's probably most obvious if you've got your Bibles, you can open up to Mark chapter 12. There was this time where one of the teachers of the law, and the teachers of the law were these religious folks in, in first century Judaism who, who understood the Scripture well, especially those first five books of the Bible that we call the Pentateuch. So these teachers of the law, they knew the law of God, what God had called them into. 
They would have known that they're called to love their neighbors. So Mark tells us that one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all of the commandments, which is most important? Again, remember, this is a teacher of the law. He knew the law, the commandments. So he asked Jesus this question. Of all of the commandments, which one matters most? And this is what Jesus replied. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is often referred to as the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And love God with all of your being. I mean, that is what this means. These different categories are just intended to say, love him with everything you have. Don't hold any part of yourself back from loving God. And then Jesus says this. Here's the most important. But I'm going to give you a bonus that's also incredibly important. Jesus says, I'm not just going to give you the first. I'm going to give you the second. And the second one is this, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So Jesus says, if we are to be people of God, children of God, if we really want to focus on the most important things, I want you to think about this because there are a lot of commands in Scripture. And over the years, a lot of commands that we as Christians have said, we need to do this and we need to do that, and rightly so. But if Jesus were standing here today, and we asked him the same question, Jesus, what's most important that we follow, that we're faithful to? I know what he'd say. He'd say, first, you love God with everything you have, and then let me tell you this. I want you to turn around and love your neighbor as yourself. And he'd say these words again to us. There's no other commandment that competes with these. That comes anywhere close to these. You love God with everything you have. And you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Well, this brings up a question, and we'll see. It doesn't just bring up a question to us, because this is maybe not super familiar language to us, at least not the way that Jesus used it, or that first century Jews, or that Jews even before that would have used this idea of neighbor. We often think about neighbor as just, again, the, the people that live down the street from us. Or maybe you might not even consider them your neighbors. You'd say, well, they're down the street from me. They're folks that live in the same neighborhood, but my neighbors are the people to the left and the right of me. Those are my neighbors. They live right next to me. And so when we ask this question, who is my neighbor, the reality is that when the Bible talks about neighbor, it's maybe used in a little bit broader fashion than you and I typically use it. So let me give you what I believe is a biblical definition of this word neighbor. And a neighbor in the Bible refers to anyone who is near or close to you, whether they are family, whether they're friends whether they're strangers or even enemies. So I want you to think about that. A neighbor could be any one of these things. A neighbor is not necessarily the person that lives in your neighborhood, although proximity is definitely part of it. But I think there's more to it than this. As we look in this definition, we can see it's not just about proximity. Yes, they're near and close to us. But when we look at these categories, we have to say it's more than just about proximity. I think it's also about opportunity. It's about, yes, the people who are close to us, but it's also about who do I have the opportunity to show love to. And it's not just people who live right next to me. It's not just people who are close in location to me. It's the people that God brings across my path and says, I want you to help. I want you to love as you love yourself, as I've loved you, I want you to love these people. So that brings on another question. And we're going to be wrestling with a few questions this morning, actually. 
To me, it brings up this question. Okay, well, if I'm called to love my neighbor, and my neighbor is someone who is in proximity to me, someone who maybe there's an opportunity to help, what does it look like then to really love my neighbor? And I think this actually works in two ways. We're going to look first at a scripture from Romans chapter 13. If you've got your Bibles, you can open to that. If not, it will be on the screen here behind me. I want you to see that loving neighbor involves two things for certain. The Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter to the Roman church, says this. He says, let no debt remain outstanding. Okay, so if you owe each other money, pay that back, the Apostle Paul says. If you've borrowed money from someone else, pay that back. But then the Apostle Paul says there's one debt that you will never be able to satisfy. No matter how much you try. Because we don't just owe that debt to each other because of each other. We owe that debt to each other because of God. And so he says this. He says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing or the ongoing debt to love one another. In other words, it will always be there. You can never pay that one off or pay that one back. You can only pay it forward in a sense. And then the Apostle Paul tells us why. He says, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Now listen to the angle that he takes on this next. He says this, the commandments. So remember, that teacher of the law came to Jesus and asked him, which is the most important commandments? And certainly he was thinking about some of these, some of the Ten Commandments, but there were many, many commandments that they had kind of gathered together, some, sometimes over 600 by some counts. But certainly he probably would have been thinking about these, like you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever commandment, whatever other commandment there may be, says the Apostle Paul, so yes, some of those 10, but many others about how we ought to treat each other. The Apostle Paul says, all of these are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So all of these commandments about how we ought to treat each other, and really the things we shouldn't do to each other, in a sense, the Apostle Paul says, can be summed up in one command, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so here is the Apostle Paul's angle on this. He says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So one answer to the question, how do I love my neighbor, is this. Love does no harm to a neighbor. But I think that's actually incomplete. It's only half of the story that we see in Scripture. You see, if we didn't have this next door, we might walk away and just say, well, love just doesn't do any harm. So it means I don't hurt people. It means that as I see someone, I don't take advantage of them. I don't do something negative to them. But there's a whole lot more to loving a neighbor than simply doing no harm to that neighbor, is there not? In our Bibles is this very famous story. Even most people who would not consider themselves Christians know this story about the Good Samaritan. I mean, we, we talk about it often. We talk about, well, that, that person right there was a Good Samaritan. What they did when they did that good deed for someone else, they're a Good Samaritan. Now, even if, even if we're not aware of where the story comes from, we know somewhere in our minds, or we have a picture of what it means to be a good Samaritan. And I would guess that many people who talk about a good Samaritan have no idea what a Samaritan actually is. But we understand that it has something to do with doing something good for someone else who maybe doesn't deserve it or, or wasn't able to do that for themselves, helping out the least of these, that's your good Samaritan deed. Well, Jesus tells this story about a good Samaritan who came to the aid of someone who had been robbed. Now, Jesus tells this story out of being asked the question, 
who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Luke 10, 25 through 37, if you just want to look, I'm just going to tell the story to you. So Jesus, in order to try to explain what a neighbor is, tells this story of this man who went on this pretty dangerous road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a very mountainous road with lots of places that robbers and bandits could lay in wait, and they often did. In fact, this was known to be a dangerous road to travel. In fact, as Jesus would have started telling the story, people would have thought, well, what was that guy doing? What was he thinking going from Jerusalem to Jericho by himself? You only travel that road as part of a caravan. And maybe one that's defended and armed. You don't travel that road by yourself. Everybody knows there's bandits and robbers on that road. But for whatever reason, this man set out to travel this road on his own. And as he's traveling, a group of bandits come down out of the hills and set upon him and beat him and take all of his things, even his clothes, leaving him there. Well, it just so happens that there were these two religious leaders that are walking down the same road. You have a priest and a Levite. The priest walks by and sees this man beaten, bloody, left for dead. And I don't know whether the priest was thinking this, but the priest didn't harm this man further. But he didn't help him either. In fact, I wonder if maybe he got as far away from him as he could because a man beaten and bloodied like that was actually considered unclean. You see, the priest knew the law. And so did the Levite. As the Levite came walking by, maybe he got as far away from this beaten, bloodied man as he could because the Levite knew the law. And he didn't want to be unclean. What they didn't know is that there are two commandments more important than any others to love God and to love your neighbor. And then there was this Samaritan. Well, Samaritans were people who were always unclean, at least by Jewish standards. They were kind of outcasts. They were at odds with the Jewish people for reasons going back hundreds of years. Samaritans and Jews did not really mingle well together in the first century. And so here comes this Samaritan the person that you would expect to look at this man who'd been beaten and bloodied and was Jewish and would think, well, he got what he deserved. And instead, that Samaritan bends over backward to help this man, to see that he's nursed back to good health, paying the bill for his medical care, giving him a ride to a place where he could become well again. And so Jesus finishes this story, <clears throat> and he asks the question. He doesn't answer the question, who is my neighbor? The question that Jesus asks is, who behaved like a neighbor in relation to this man? You see, that's a very different question, and that's the one Jesus wants us to wrestle with. And that day the teacher of the law knew the answer. The one who showed mercy upon him. That one acted like a neighbor. Because there's no doubt that love does no harm, but the priest and the Levite, they didn't harm the man any further. They, they didn't help him either, though. And so, yes, while, while love definitely does no harm, love also seeks good on behalf of a neighbor seeks the good of the neighbor because that's what it means for us to be neighbors as well. So again, I will love. I will love. I will love my neighbor. But will we truly? I've got another question that I think maybe we can wrestle with just a little bit. As we try to make things practical for us in our day and age, And it's a question that does move us to practice, to action. How can we practice loving our neighbors in our daily lives? 
Well, I think first, we have to say kind of in summary of what we've been talking about, loving your neighbor is not just about being kind and polite. That's great. Be kind and polite. Don't be nasty, right? That's good. Be kind and polite for sure, but also loving our neighbor is about working for the genuine good of your neighbor. I've just got a few suggestions that may be helpful to you as you wrestle with this question, how can I practice love for neighbor well? How can I practice love for neighbor well? I'm going to have the the same words in several of these answers. The first two in particular, be intentional. And intentional is highlighted in yellow because so often we just think, well, if the opportunity comes, if it's obvious, then I will step out and help someone. What about for looking for opportunities to help those people who live in proximity to you or that you come across whose pathways cross with yours? What if we were to be intentional as it relates to learning the needs and struggles of those around you? Well, that would mean building relationships with. That would mean walking across the road and having conversations with. That would mean asking questions and stepping into the mess of the lives of those we come into contact with. That would mean not just doing the easy thing and not just allowing conversations to be surface level everywhere we go, but digging a little bit deeper. Seeking to know someone and maybe even taking that step of vulnerability and being known by someone so that we can learn the struggles and needs of those around you. Be intentional. I can promise you this. These things rarely happen by accident. But when we take the step of intent, we start to find out that there are needs and struggles all around us. I can remember being in a meeting in the first few years here, and I don't remember who it was that said it, and I really wondered if it it was true. You know, we live in this very wealthy county. There really aren't needs around us. I think we only believe that if we engage at the surface in the lives of others. If we start to dig beneath the surface, we'll find out, and yes, maybe it's not financial, but there are other struggles and needs that surround you. All right, second one, this. So move from being intentional in learning about to discovering to being intentional in helping to meet the needs and struggles of your neighbors as you become aware of them. That that one, probably you'd think that that should be pretty obvious, right? But how often when we learn the need and struggle, do we just formulate an excuse and kind of step out of that situation instead of stepping deeper into that situation? Well, we know it may get messy. It may be difficult. It may mean we have to give up something we love so that we can show love to someone else. And then the last one, be intentional about reaching out to those who are different from you. Because that's one of the things we learn in the story of the Good Samaritan. Is that oftentimes we're going, we're building bridges where bridges have been destroyed because of history maybe years of conflict and anxiety and frustration, but we are bridge builders where bridges have been destroyed as followers of Jesus. And so we become intentional about reaching out to people who are different from us. Whether those differences be of race, religion, or social status, we are bridge builders as followers of Jesus. And so I just want to leave you with this question. And I want you to imagine with me I mean, what would the world be like? What would the world look like? If we as followers of Jesus, what would your neighborhood look like? If everybody in your neighborhood who said they follow Jesus chose to practice genuine love in relation to the neighbors around them? What would this world of darkness look like if we started to see little pieces of light popping up all over the place. I can tell you this, the world wouldn't look nearly so dark. And certainly, we would be making a difference in the lives of those who need to know that they are loved by us 
and loved by God as well. Well, again, as we said at the beginning, today is Mission Sunday. Today is a chance uh, for us to give, and I just want to tell you how you can give because we, we haven't passed the baskets for the last several years. We all know why, right? So we haven't done that in a number of years. But we have moved most of our giving to an online platform. We also have a couple of boxes as you exit here if you choose to give by cash or check to help support these works. Here's what I want you to know. Every dollar that is given today or we've got on our uh, web page, there's a, there's a page for giving also in the app. We have a fund created specifically for Mission Sunday and you, you can find that there easily. So every dime, every dollar that is given today, this week, will go to support mission work in this world. And I will leave that same fund open for the next couple of weeks so that you can give there if you want to. If you're not prepared to give today, thumbs up, we understand that. Maybe you've been compelled to think about giving more even today because you know that supporting the work of the kingdom of God is always worth it. Whether it be in your neighborhood, or whether it be anywhere else in this world. Let me pray over you and pray over our offering that God would bless it and truly multiply it. Multiply it for the good of the kingdom in this world in which we live and we have the opportunity to show love. Let's pray. God, I pray that as we, uh, as we give on this special day, Father, I'm excited for this opportunity to give so that the gospel can be advanced in places like India and Mexico, other places in South America. Father, and even places that where, where you're slowly bringing us new opportunities, God, there are other opportunities to give, so many opportunities to give that it can be overwhelming. God, would you help us to give in a way that first, Father, we'll be generous, but then, Father, that your blessings through our giving will pour out in a generous way as well. Father, we want to see the gospel advanced. We want to see neighbors be loved well. Father, we want to participate in your mission this way. Bless it. Truly multiply what we offer. I pray this in Jesus' name. And the church together said, amen. God bless you all. Let's stand and sing.